Hello and welcome. I'm going to be introducing one of our new theme flights starting off 2021 for the winter time. It's a flight that I'm calling Explorations. It's based on Chardonnay and it's going to be showing differences in vintage years as well as different techniques in natural winemaking. Each wine in this flight is uh, according to our practices of native yeast, native ML, very low levels of sulfite, sometimes none, and surly aging, and otherwise just the minimalist techniques. So they're the clean wines that we always produce. Chardonnay is a really nice wine to work with for educational purposes. It can make great wines all over the world, but shows the differences in the climate or soils or weather conditions for any given year. Uh, so it's really interesting how it uh, really shows up those differences. Virginia, in terms of Chardonnay, is kind of a unique area. Uh, we have warm summer and warm fall ripening conditions, but most grape growing areas are obviously going to be drier than Virginia is, but usually we see that nighttime temperatures drop considerably compared to the daytimes, and very common is warmer days with cooler nights. Virginia, on the other hand, has warm nights to go with those warm days, and the warmer the nighttime temperatures, the more that we reduce the secondary acid in grapes during ripening, which is called malic acid. You're all relatively familiar with malic acid because you've heard the term malolactic fermentation. That's this natural conversion when malic acid is converted to lactic acid and that uh, puts off as a byproduct that buttery character. So the most common place to pick this up is going to be in those California Chardonnays because their, their cooler nighttime temperatures retain more malic acid at harvest time, which once it goes through this malolactic conversion, which is done by bacteria, it uh, gives you a lot of that buttery character. Whereas the warm nights in Virginia, uh, we break down that acid over the course of ripening to a much lower level by the time that we're picking. And even if we do complete malolactic uh, conversion, you end up with a very low level of that buttery character. Now, any of this can be manipulated any which way, and we're not going to go into that. But it would um, suffice to say that our traditional style for our Terra Chardonnays, based on our climate, has that um, little bit of freshness to it and uh, fullness, roundness, rich characteristic, all those great things that come from ripe fruit and native yeast, but very minimal of this buttery character in a normal year. So uh, it's also interesting to say that Chardonnay really does kind of develop an age interesting for a white wine. In a lot of ways, it mimics what we see with red wines. So we put our Chardonnay usually through some longer cellar aging and longer bottle aging, and it evolves more similar to a red compared to most of the whites, and can continue to really uh, develop complexity over time with bottle aging. So I find it really interesting. The flight is five wines, and three of them uh, that we have are vintage year comparisons. So the first three are the 17, 18, and 19 Artera Chardonnays made in my normal technique, which is steel fermentation to give you that brighter, fresher feel, and neutral oak aging on the lees for about 10 months before they bottle, and then they'll bottle about six months before they release sometimes more or less. They probably only need a few months. And uh, this um, technique uh, has consistently given us that fresh balance in the wines with the richness and the fullness. So 2017 and 2019 pretty much fall right into this pattern and style. Uh, in the sequence though, 2018 stands out a little bit different. 2018 was that really wet year. It pushed harvesting a little bit earlier. I think naturally some of the acid levels were a little bit higher in 2018, but that was somewhat exacerbated by pushing picking a little bit earlier um, because of pressure that we had because the fruit was going to degrade under the wet conditions. So the 2018 fruit at harvest came in with 
a bit higher level than usual of malic acid and it naturally in our cellar goes through the malolactic conversion and 2018 then does show a little bit more of this buttery component than we're used to seeing. Uh, so it's really neat to see in those first three wines, 17, 18, and 19, both the vintage year differences and also some of the um, aspects of how the wine develops its complexity over time and its aging and its ageability. So very interesting starting there. Then we go into the real exploration side of it. So these are playing with different techniques in natural winemaking that I've been learning about by trying other wines and a lot of the wines that we carry here as the curated clean wine selections and sometimes the guest wines. But I um, try all those wines trying to understand why they taste the way they do, what are the techniques uh, that are associated with those wines and see what might fit into our program as uh, small lots, again, of specialty wines that can just add more depth and interesting characteristics to those of you who've been following along for a time and are interested in continuing your paths of exploration in natural wines. So one of the first ones that we have is a zero sulfite Chardonnay. So I'm going to show you the bottle because the image changes from what had been on the front, the tipping wine cup, and there is some story to that for another day, to very subtly the zero symbol on the front of the bottle. Uh, on the first printing of the bottle, that is the only difference to differentiate it. Now, uh, this wine is produced following some of the wines that I've seen that are the most interesting, intriguing, and complex wines that I've had out of the selections that we've been carrying and trying. The basic concept is it's ultra-minimalist handling. So instead of fermenting in steel and then settling right after the fermentation of the solids and moving slightly cloudy wine into a neutral barrel to age, which then after nine months gets filtered and so forth as needed, or at least clarified to whatever extent, the zero sulfite wine gets basically zero handling. It is fermented in the barrel and stays in that barrel and never moves and goes straight into the bottle. So at the end of the fermentation, the wine is very cloudy and drops this heavy sediment to the bottom of the barrel. That sediment is going to be a natural antioxidant. So if we stay on those heavier lees, that's going to buffer us and protect us from oxygen as long as we don't inadvertently expose the wine to additional oxygen throughout its aging. So there's a couple things going on here. One is that the barrel fermentation process uh, can, uh, from thermodynamics, trap the temperature, the heat, the progression of the fermentation a little differently. Then we get in stainless steel, you get a little bit more of a breathing during the fermentation and you tend to get from barrel ferments that a uh, little bit richer, rounder, fuller, um, but smoother maybe in some ways, uh, characteristic to the wine. So one aspect of this is gonna be the, the barrel fermentation. Second is going to be aging on those heavy lees. They do get once or twice stirred through the aging process so that they don't develop sulfur compounds or reductive characteristics, some of those flaws from the wines being sitting stagnant. Uh, but at the same time, you get some extra complexity and depth uh, from having these wine, these lees in the wine. So the wine, in addition to using the antioxidant nature of the lees, is supplemented by always being protected with inert gases. So I use nitrogen. That means any time that that barrel is opened, before it's open, there's nitrogen blowing at that uh, barrel opening so that oxygen never encounters the surface of the wine and then it gets topped up to the top of that barrel with additional zero sulfite wine and is kept closed as much as possible and opened as little as possible. 
Then when it's time for bottling, the wine has settled, the solids are down at the bottom. We bottle straight out of that barrel, right into the bottle filler. And the bottle filler is then gassed with nitrogen on the top of the reservoir, so it's not picking up oxygen over the course of the bottling process. And extra attention, making sure that we have fully disparged, sparged oxygen from the bottles prior to filling, again, replacing it with nitrogen. And same thing when we put the screw caps on, that we have thoroughly evacuated oxygen from the neck and the cap so that um, there is no oxygen present in the top of that bottle when it's getting bottled. So it really encounters almost no oxygen uh, post-fermentation over the course of its life. That with the natural antioxidant lees is how this wine is produced. The flip side or more conventional side um, to it is once you come off of those heavy lees, that's when the wine is more predisposed to some type of oxidation or oxygen influenced decline and that's where sulfite comes in. So as soon as uh, any wine is removed from those heavy primary fermentation lees, if it doesn't have sulfite, it is much more predisposed to um, some type of decay uh, from oxygen exposure. So the last feature of this wine is that it is bottled a little bit cloudy because it comes straight out of the barrel that it was fermented in unfiltered. So that will naturally settle down to the bottom of the bottle. And my personal preference having tried other uh, unfiltered wines and these wines is that I find it best to actually integrate that sediment throughout the bottle before you open it. Uh, so it's evenly distributed. So it isn't very clear in your first pour and very sedimented at your last pour, either one of which may not actually reflect the overall characteristic of the wine. So I just like to take it and give it either a couple gentle flips, maybe while it's upside down, a little gentle swirl like that. And you can see in the bottle that it will have evenly become a little bit more cloudy. It's not extreme once you pour it into the glass, so it's not gonna be a big deal once you see it. Uh, but I will let it sit for just another 30 seconds even for any heaviest solids to drop back down to the bottom of the bottle for when you pour. So I encourage any of these uh, sedimented wines that that's a good approach to it because it actually gives you the flavors, characteristics, and features of those lees throughout um, the experience of drinking that bottle. So I just find this one really interesting because it is fermented with pressed juice the same way that we normally ferment, um, but the absence of sulfite gives a little bit of a darker tint to the wine, um, but just I think really interesting, complex flavors, features, and characteristics come out, but definitely different and unique from our traditional process, steel fermented and neutral oak aged Chardonnays. The next one that we have is going to be our first Amphora Chardonnay. So let me show you that bottle. So this one is going to have, trying to get it to show up right on the camera. Lovely little picture of amphora on the front of the bottle. So, this one is, in addition to being produced in amphora, fermented in amphora, this one is produced as what you would call an orange wine or sometimes an amber wine. The terms are somewhat interchangeable. This means that it was fermented on the skins for at least some period of time. Uh, in this case, it was the full two weeks of fermentation until that wine was fully dry, until it finished fermenting sugar, it was on the skins, at which point in time it was pressed, and in this case, after that two weeks on the skins in the amphora, it was moved to a neutral oak barrel as our first trial of this, and having only had one amphora at the time, making space for Petit Verdot to go into that amphora following the Chardonnay fermentation. So this is just our first time because now we have a second amphora so that we can ferment actually in both on the skins for the two week period of time. And this is what we just did in 2020, which is the vintage following the ones that I'm showing here. 
So after fermenting on the skins in both those amphora, I can press them both and then return that wine to the one larger amphora and it spends its entire life in amphora. So that's what we have right now going on with the 2020 vintage and we're going to be learning from that too. So features of the amphora wine is why are we doing this? Well, one, I find clay really interesting because it is the most ancient uh, vessel material for winemaking. It goes back to, I forget the numbers, 6,000, 8,000 BC, something like that, in what I think is called Eastern Anatolia, which is over in Georgia, Eastern Turkey, Armenia, Northern Iran, that whole area which was the birthplace of wine in that region. Uh, at that point in time, that would have been buried clay containers in the earth, and they would have been consumed locally. It was not a transport product when you go that far back. It wasn't until the Egyptians and the Greeks that you actually got into smaller amphora that were used to ferment and transport and hold the wine until they were used. But they were still clay. Uh, the oldest ones were larger containers, similar to other food storage containers. They would ferment in the ground and age on the skins in the ground and stay in this container until they were consumed either by a smaller size one for a family or a larger size one for a community and some type of event. So I find it fascinating to look at how ancient wines were made and how they may have tasted and appeared to people back when. And initially I would have thought that ancient wines would probably all have been horrible, but they would have had alcohol and that was good enough. I am now under the impression from a number of the wines I have tried that follow ancient techniques that that is definitely not the case, that there was some amazing wines being produced uh, throughout history. The big difference being that they would have been consumed much younger, again, right out of either the in the ground uh, clay vessel or from a clay transport vessel, uh, the original fermentation container most of the time. So young, bright, fresh, vivid, but still like great, amazing potential for flavors. And if you never moved it, you wouldn't have needed sulfite in the first place. I have in this first take of uh, the Amphora Chardonnay, really small amount of sulfite like I use in my other wines. That's because I pressed it after fermentation and wanted to make sure that we got through the times that it needed to be moved and bottled and aged appropriately but I think it's quite benign, the level that it's at. Uh, so this one is really interesting, the characteristics of it, because the amphora clay vessel in and of itself produces some of those same features that I associate with the barrel fermentation, which is a little bit more of that softer, richer, textured characteristic, not as much of the like bright fresh that we get with the steel fermentation, so more of like a deep complexity to the wines. Um, maybe, maybe you can't pick up some of the minerality from the amphora, but in addition to, I think, the thermodynamics and the, the media itself, there is the feature of the skin contact during the fermentation. So normally I have no skin contact uh, for my white fermentations. They're pressed immediately from the grapes to juice. In this case, just like the reds went into the amphora, and amphora in this case, but for, um, starts fermenting on the skins, ferments all the way through on the skins and extracts from the skins during this fermentation process. So you're gonna get a little bit more of uh, a characteristic um, that came from skin instead of pulp in the uh, orange wine feature of this. So that can be a little bit more of a phenolic character. Um, again, I think some extra layers and depth and some different flavors to it uh, that I find really interesting. And I think it came out really quite great. Uh, so I'm really excited about this and I'm excited to learn what differences in management there are in aging it throughout its lifespan in Amphora, which is coming up in this second um, 2020 batch that we're working on in the cellar right now. So the Amphora Chardonnay uh, and the Zero Sulfite are 2019s. The Amphora Chardonnay is also unfiltered. So it was uh, 
taken out of the barrel into the bottling and retain some of that sediment. And it didn't have to be done that way, but I think it benefits some from some of the complexity and characteristics that you get from that sediment, um, the yeast lees. So these are features that um, are naturally occurring and if in proper balance, I think add to uh, the wine overall and the experience of the wine. So um, I think it was a great first shot. So hopefully you guys try these, have a good time. Uh, they'll be around for a little while, not a long while because the Zero Sulfite and the M4 wine first runs are only uh, each 24 cases. I have them ramped up for our second vintage each to 50 cases, which is probably where they'll stay as small specialty lots. Uh, for people that are interested in that. Um, but the Amphora wine, also I encourage you to invert it, give it a little bit of a shake or a mix to um, integrate that sediment uh, to improve the overall experience that you have with your bottle. All the Chardonnay should be served cool, not cold. Uh, definitely brings out the most interesting characteristics in them and I think they all should do pretty interesting things with bottle aging. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy.